Have you ever thought about the bottom of the ocean? What does it actually look like in the deepest parts of our planet? And how deep can a person actually go in the ocean? These questions have long intrigued sailors and ocean explorers. Bathymetry is the measurement of ocean depths and charting of the shape and topography of the ocean floor. In other words, it is the field of science dedicated to the ups and downs of the ocean floor. It is particularly focused on the presence of features like underwater mountains, volcanoes, valleys, and canyons. As far back as the ancient Greeks around 100 BC, sailors have studied bathymetry with the use of sounding lines. A sounding line is exactly what it sounds like. A long weighted rope with a plummet or weight usually made of lead at its end. Regardless of its composition, the plummet is usually called a lead. The line itself has distances marked off at regular intervals. So sailors drop the lead into the water and let it sink to the sea floor as they hold on to the other end of the line. They can then simply measure the length of rope that extends from their boat to the bottom of the ocean. The standard unit of ocean depth is called a fathom. One fathom equals 1.8 meters or about six feet. One of the biggest milestones in oceanography came between 1872 and 1876, when English scientists launched a major expedition to study the ocean. They converted a former Royal Navy vessel, the HMS Challenger, into a floating laboratory for taking measurements of ocean depth, collecting and studying marine life, and collecting information on ocean currents, wind, and climate. With the use of sounding lines, the Challenger expedition was able to make some astounding discoveries about the topography of our seafloor, discovering some of the deepest places on our planet. The Challenger Expedition, as it was called, laid the groundwork for the modern field of oceanography. Since then, of course, methods have improved. Since the late 20th century, scientists have largely relied on instruments called echo sounders for bathymetry. These devices operate like sonar they determine the depth of the sea floor or any other objects in the water by emitting sounds and then measuring the time it takes for the echoes of those sounds to return to the device. Seismic profiling involves something similar. In this approach, explosions or air guns are used to produce strong, low frequency sounds that penetrate the sea floor. Again, devices measure the time it takes for the reflections of the, these sounds to travel through the water. In addition to telling us about the depth of the ocean, seismic profiling can also be used to study the structure of sediments and rocks beneath the sea floor. Today, submersible vehicles, submarines, and autonomous vehicles like drones allow scientists to make direct observations of the ocean floor. In many cases, these vehicles may tow echo sounders or seafloor imaging devices, providing a wealth of data about the bottom of the ocean. So, with all of these instruments and devices, what have we actually learned about our ocean? 
Well, let's imagine for a moment that we could drain all of the water out of the ocean and expose the sea floor of our planet. We could then drive from the Western Hemisphere, North America, to the Eastern Hemisphere, Europe, across the Great Basin of the Atlantic Ocean. What would we see along the way? What would we find? Bathymetry has the answer. We call this graph the hypsographic curve. It illustrates the bathymetry of our world ocean. The vertical axis is elevation and the horizontal axis is the surface area of our planet. The highest point on Earth, the peak of Mount Everest in the Himalayan mountains, rises a little over 29,000 feet or 8,800 meters above sea level. The deepest point on Earth is located in a place called the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean. Its base is located more than 36,000 feet or 10,000 meters below sea level. In other words, if we could move Mount Everest to the bottom of the ocean, it would be submerged entirely underwater. The ocean is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. Of course, the ocean floor is complex. It has many ups and downs. Mountains and valleys and canyons of astounding size can be found across the great basins of the world ocean. So let's start our journey across this ocean basin and see what we encounter along the way. We begin on the dry land of the coastal plain where beaches, lagoons, and other environments transition into the ocean. Beginning here, the first 50 miles of our journey span the continental shelf, a shallow ledge that surrounds the continents of our world. It is usually about 400 feet deep and extends outward into the sea about 50 miles. Along the way, we begin to observe deep cuts into the shelf called submarine canyons. These canyons formed in the distant past, millions of years ago, when sea level was much lower than it is today, as it was during various ice ages. During these times, the continental shelf was exposed to the air and rivers flowed across it outward into the ocean. As these rivers flowed over the shelf, they weathered and eroded the rock and sediment, carving these deep canyons that are now submerged beneath the ocean. Today, the canyons are simply landmarks along our journey across the ocean basin. As we continue, we reach the end of the continental shelf and find a steep slope, the continental slope. The slope is so steep that sediment tends to fall down it, creating large underwater avalanches of sediment called turbidity currents. These turbidity currents result in the sedimentation of turbidity deposits. These deposits consist of layers of sand, silt, and clay with graded bedding sedimentary structures, with the largest grains deposited first, followed by the smallest grains. As we drive across these turbidity deposits, in an area known as the Continental Rise, we finally approach the Abyssal Plain, the low-lying area of the ocean that covers most of the Earth's surface. Here, the ocean is usually about 12,000 feet or 3,800 meters deep.
This part of the seafloor is typically dark all day long as sunlight can't penetrate all of the water located above it. Life forms are somewhat uncommon and the ecosystem is generally sparse relative to the rich, diverse environments of the continental shelf. At this point, our journey is far from complete. Depending on where we begin our road trip, we may yet encounter the most impressive mountain chain in the world, one of the Earth's deepest trenches, or any number of underwater mountains or volcanoes called sea mounts. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is a continuous mountain range of peaks and valleys that extends through all of the ocean basins. It's over 46,000 miles long, over 600 miles wide, and about a mile and a half high. From the Mid-Atlantic to the Southern Pacific Ocean, it wraps around the planet like the seams on a baseball. Here, at the mid-ocean ridge, the seafloor is spreading as magma rises between two pieces of the crust, which we call tectonic plates. As this magma cools, it creates new igneous rock, which we call oceanic crust. This crust forces old crust to move away from the ridge. It causes seafloor spreading. The mid-ocean ridge is what we call a spreading center. It is the location where two tectonic plates move apart from each other and drift in divergent directions, carrying the continents along for the ride with them. The cooling of magma creates igneous rocks, such as these pillow-shaped basalts, which make up the new oceanic crust at the mid-ocean ridge. Magma is located close to the sea floor at the mid-ocean ridge. When water seeps into cracks in the sea floor and approach this magma, it quickly becomes superheated and turns into water vapor. This water vapor rises back to the sea floor, carrying along the way heat, energy, and various minerals and nutrients. The water vapor returns to the ocean as an underwater geyser called a hydrothermal vent. Depending on the minerals that are dissolved in the water vapor, the vents may be black smokers or white smokers. In both cases, the vents provide heat, energy, nutrients, and other resources that support diverse communities of life forms. Indeed, hydrothermal vents and the mid-ocean ridge contains some of the most diverse ecosystems in the deep ocean. Naturally, if rocks are being created at the mid-ocean ridge, they must be destroyed elsewhere. There is a global conveyor belt in our ocean, one created and maintained by the formation of rock and crust in one place the mid-ocean ridge, and its destruction elsewhere in the deep ocean trenches of our planet. In these trenches, two plates converge with each other in a process called subduction. In subduction, one tectonic plate sinks beneath another. As this sinking plate returns to the earth, it melts under the high temperatures and pressures within our planet, once again becoming hot fluid magma. This conveyor belt 
the divergence and convergence of tectonic plates creating crust, rock, and magma is continuous and drives the ever-changing landscape on our planet. It is the process that causes the continents of our planet to move and drift away from each other over geologic timescales. It is the process responsible for continental drift. As it turns out then, bathymetry helps us understand our planet, not just today, but throughout its long geologic history as well.